God, you are the one. You are the one. You are the love that leads us. You are the light that leads us. Like a fire burning, son of God, you are the one. You are.
Welcome once again to the Wise Heart Family Singers Chapel Hour. The four words that I want you to take away from this service, regardless of your situation, the four words I want you to burn into your memory are these. God is in control. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, uh, this message is just words on paper. But your word, Lord, is not bound by paper. It's not bound by anything. It can go and accomplish what you send it to do. So we pray today that as we look through this example of the early church and how you were in complete control of this particular situation, that, Lord, you will make it real in our lives and whatever our situation lord we will be encouraged and strengthened to know that no matter what we're going through you are in control and you will see us through and we thank you by faith for that for we ask it in jesus name amen as we read the newspapers and view the conditions of the world through all the various news media, we may be tempted to feel that the world is out of control. But if we will study to show ourselves approved under God, workmen that need not be ashamed, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, then it will quickly put everything into the proper perspective. Now it's true. Perilous times are coming, and evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 13. Some will depart from the faith. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. And the love of many will wax cold. Matthew 24, verse 12. But it is also true that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Daniel 4, verses 25 and 32. God is in control. Many people read the book of Revelation in an effort to interpret all the signs and the symbols. However, when I read the book of Revelation, one of the most encouraging messages I see is this. The book of Revelation shows us a glorious church that has survived all the enemy could throw at it, but God's grace and by his grace, she still stands victorious. We see a defeated enemy. No matter what we may go through now, in the end, Satan loses. We see a wonderful Savior who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we hear the voice of a great multitude crying, Alleluia, alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. He is the Alpha and the Omega, 
the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Revelation 22, verse 13. God has been, He is, and He always will be in control. An incident in the life of the early church gives us a wonderful example of this. It shows us how in a really dangerous situation, no matter what was happening, God had everything under control. It's found in the 12th chapter of Acts. And this chapter can be divided into three sections. You have a ruthless persecution, you have a miraculous deliverance, and you have a joyous reunion. Now look at those first verses in this uh, chap 12th chapter of Acts. We see Herod quite active, but all of his actions are politically motivated. Now, this year we're seeing a lot of that uh, via our television sets and our news media. Uh, Herod had arrested James, the brother of John, and then had him executed. Herod saw that this pleased the Jews, so he arrests Peter also. He puts him in prison and orders 16 soldiers to guard him. Now, note Back in Acts 5, there was another time when the disciples had been arrested and put in prison, and there again an angel had delivered them. But note here in this situation, Peter is chained to a guard each on each side of him. Here he is, he's got a guard on each side, he's chained to this guard, he's chained to this guard. There are two more guards at the door, and there are 12 more guards either guarding other exits or serving as uh, relief guards during the night. The, the only reason given for Herod's arrest of Peter is found in verse 3 of this chapter, because he saw that it pleased the Jews. Well, perhaps he thought, well, if uh, killing one apostle will make me popular, I'll, I'll just execute another one. Then I'll really be popular. That would really raise his standings in the poll, and who better to arrest than Peter? In this picture, it seems like Herod is the one who is in complete control. One apostle is dead. One is in prison under the guard of 16 soldiers. There is the implications that this wicked king could just sit back and enjoy the prestige he was about to gain not only with the Jews, but also with Caesar. But things were about to change. Acts 12, 5 gives us the four words that made all the difference in the world, I think. Peter was kept in prison, it says. Then there's those four words, but prayer was made. But prayer was made. And sometimes when you're studying the Bible, note some of the significant places you'll find that little conjunction, but. Here's the situation, it says, but prayer was made. Look at Romans 5, verse 8. We were without strength, we were ungodly, we were aliens, we were enemies, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, has quickened us together with Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. The priests in the Old Testament, they offered many sacrifices, the Bible says, that could never take away sins. They could never take away sins or, or do anything as far as the conscience of man was concerned. But then it says, but this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Then, here again, in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, but prayer was made for Peter in prison. Made, it says, it was made without ceasing of the church under God for Peter. Uh, eager, fervent, constant prayer was being made. But prayer, these two words have changed the destinies and changed tragedy to triumph throughout the history of the church. 
The church with her arms lifted in prayer wields a more powerful weapon than any weapon that man can present. So, the stage is set. Which will prevail? The dungeon, the guards, and the wicked king? Or the prayers of God's people? The precautions of Herod were a challenge to the power of God. Here is as much as said, well, they did it once, maybe back in Acts chapter 5, they did it once, supernatural or not, it's not going to happen again. But while the bloodthirsty king slept, a faithful band of Christians was praying. Hallelujah. Now we have the miraculous deliverance. The events leading to Peter's deliverance should, should cheer the heart of any, most, most any despondent Christian. The scene suggests absolute hopelessness. Peter in an inner prison. Peter chained between two guards. His slightest move could have awakened them if they were even asleep at all. Two more guards were at the door. Twelve more guards between Peter and the outside world. The great iron gate would be faced when they, if they did get out. But prayer was made. Without ceasing, eagerly, fervently, constantly by the church for Peter's deliverance. It had been seven days in this seemingly hopeless situation. What's Peter doing? He's asleep. He had committed everything into the, into the Lord's hand. He could sleep because he knew God was in control. He may have thought about the possibility of dying because Jesus at one time had implied that he might die a martyr's death. But uh, God's answer to the prayers of the church was sudden and dramatic. God was answering Herod's challenge. The answer was so awesome, Peter thought he was having a vision. He was suddenly awakened by an angel, and he's changed, fellow. I kind of like the way the uh, message translation of the uh, Bible puts this little verse here. Uh, this is the way it writes. The angel shook Peter, got him up. Hurry, get dressed, put on your shoes, grab your coat, and let's get out of here. <laughs> so, thank the Lord for uh, God's de wonderful deliverance. He was told to get dressed, follow his deliverer. No alarm was sounded. Whether the guards were asleep or awake, they were supernaturally prevented from seeing Peter's escape. When they got to the great iron gate, it just opened up of its own accord. They went through the gate, and the angel disappeared. And Peter finally realized, it's not a vision, I'm free. And so he went to the home of Mary, John Mark's mother, to, to let them know everything that had happened. And uh, the scene that follows is just a little bit humorous. Uh, we have Peter knocking at the door. And Rhoda, one of the servants, she comes to the door and, and she answers the door. Who is it? Uh, it's me, Peter. Peter! You sure? Yes, it's me, Peter. She recognized his voice and she got so excited she forgot to let him in. And she left him standing at the door while she ran back in to tell everybody what had happened. Well, the prayer meeting for Peter's deliverance had been interrupted with the answer. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a, a, a need or something and you're praying and all of a sudden the answer's there. I've heard it. I've seen it or listened and read that it has happened uh, in times past. I remember, I think it was George Mueller. Uh, they said he just did everything by prayer. And they were praying uh, for food one time. They had run out of food. And while they were praying, someone knocked at the door and they brought in the food that they needed. So God still does answer prayer like that there. So she came in, she told them what had happened, that Peter out there, and nobody believed it. Well, it's rather humorous, yet, and it's hard to picture. Here's the excited Rhoda, and here's the confused group, and here's Peter. He's still standing out there at the door, knocking, wanting to get in. Well, when the group finally went to the door and let him in, they were astonished. When Peter finally got them quieted down, he told them what had happened. And I'm sure at that time, 
that prayer meeting turned into a praise meeting. I would not doubt that one bit. God proved to these praying saints that he was in control. And we see this, we see this all through the book of Acts. The first two chapters of Acts in Pentecost, uh, Acts 3 and 4, the healing of, of the lame man at the gate beautiful. Chapter 8, Philip's revival in Samaria. Chapter 9, Paul's conversion. Chapter 10, 10 when Paul was sent to Cornelius. And then here in chapter 12, uh, we just see it so plain God was in control in every one of these situations. Now note the time of Peter's deliverance. It was not until the last moment. It was n there was no humanly possible way of escape. When hope was almost gone. In Romans chapter 4, verse 18, Paul is talking about the faith of Abraham. And at one point he says, uh, Abraham, when all hope was gone, he hoped on. God was in control. Earnest prayer had gone up for several days. The last day came. No answer yet. The last night fell. Still no answer. Long, weary days and hours of prayer had passed. Now, at the very last moment, just before the dawn, God sends his angel to set the prisoner free. Hallelujah. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The faithful prayers of the church have been answered. Now, how would we apply that to today? Well, remember the situation of Paul. He's a prisoner. He's in chains. 16 guards, an iron gate, all of these things we've already mentioned. Uh, we could say with that, uh, with confidence that no matter what our circumstances, no matter how severe our persecution, no matter how impossible the situation may be, God is still in control. God promised Abraham a son. Both Abraham and Sarah laughed years past. Both were past childbearing capabilities, but God was in control. God gave Joseph a vision of his future, but his brothers caught him. They put him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. Later he went to prison. And uh, there are uh, four words you'll find several times in the story of Joseph that you should remember along with the four I gave you at the beginning of the service. Four times in that story of Joseph, it says God was with Joseph. God was in control. Hallelujah. Israel, God brought Israel out of Egypt and later through the Red Sea, through the Jordan River, through years of persecution, years of crying out to God, impossible situations, but in every one of them, God was in control. Daniel was persecuted and thrown into the lion's den, but God was in control. The three Hebrew children were thrown into a fiery furnace where the fire was seven times hotter than it usually was, but God was in control. From Genesis 1 to Calvary, Satan tried to prevent the completion of God's plan of salvation. He tried it in the Garden of Eden when he deceived Eve. He tried it in the book of Esther when he tried to get rid of all the Jews. He tried it at the time of Christ's birth when they killed all the children. He tried it in the desert when he, he tempted Jesus with all the temptations that we read of. And he tried it on the cross. Jesus died. And he was taken down. He was taken and put in a tomb. And I'm sure Satan was dancing with glee and saying, I did it. Finally, I did it. And he put a sign on the rock there and said, The end. But I think maybe God just chuckled a little bit, came and reached his hand down, took this thing off, put another sign on there, to be continued. And it was. Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended unto his Father, and he's at the right hand of God right now, interceding for you and me. So, God was in control then, and he's still in control now. 
Perhaps you've been praying. Maybe days have passed. Maybe hours, years. You don't have an answer yet. Maybe you're asking, is there a way out? What, what is the answer? Don't give up. Please don't give up. I remember a little uh, bit of verse that said, the devil trembles when he sees the weakest man or woman upon their knees. Daniel, in Daniel 10, Daniel prayed, and it was three weeks before he got the answer. When he finally did get the answer, the angel said, Daniel, I heard your prayer the moment you prayed it. But I had a little difficulty getting here to answer it. But I'm here now. I'm, I've got everything under control. And I'm going to answer your prayer. God's Word tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Pray without ceasing. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, Praying always. In James chapter 5, verse 16, The effectual, fervent, prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, in everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your requests known unto God. So, as I mentioned at first, we have a severe persecution. We have an impossible situation. We have a wonderful deliverance. But prayer was made. God was in control. And the answer came in a dramatic way. And a prayer meeting was turned into a praise meeting. Hallelujah. So, I don't know what your situation may be right now. I'm sure that uh, someone out there, you have a situation that you really need God to move in. So, right now, I think I would just ask you, ask you just to close your eyes, close your eyes, and just imagine God right there by your side, right there by your side, whispering in your ear. He says, let not your heart be troubled. I've got everything under control. Peace I leave with you. My peace give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. God is in control. Father, we pray right now, should there be anyone with a problem or situation, some something where they really need an answer from you, Lord, let them, take, let them take courage from this little illustration from the book of Acts that shows how you had everything under control, even though it went down to the, just almost the last seconds. And then you sent the answer. Lord, I pray right now that as we look to you, that hearts will be encouraged Hearts will be encouraged to look to you and to grasp hold by faith that answer and believe that the answer is on the way. To believe that you are in control and you are going to meet their need. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you by faith for the answer. For we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for The Chapel Hour with Rev. Russell Weishart and the Weishart Family Singers. For previous programs, you can find them on the Weishart Family Singers YouTube channel. If you enjoyed today's message and would like access to Brother Weishart's messages and sermons, please go to thechapelhour.blogspot.com. And of course, the best way to stay in touch with us is on the Weishart Family Singers Facebook page. Everyone, thanks so much for finding us for your encouragement, and a special thank you for hitting that little like button. We look forward to seeing you next week on The Chapel Hour.